Welcome, Suzanne. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So let's discuss your book, Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All. Um, Amazing that you wrote this. There is so much information in here. It must have taken you a really long time to write and research and get it all like perfect with all the bullet points. And I don't know, it was just like, I feel like it's almost like a a textbook sounds pejorative in some way, but it's like the like the resource on free speech. Like that's what it is. Like everyone, every lawyer should have it. Everybody should have it on their on their shelf in terms of like any questions related to this whole topic. Um, that wasn't really a question, just a, a rave. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. Yeah, it's like, well, mo- yeah, moms don't have time to write books. <laughs> um, <laughs> more like it. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, it was a bit of a high wire act, but. Uh, well, tell me, tell yeah, me about yeah. it. Tell me when you, when did you decide, and you're also a CEO of Pan America. When did you decide to write this book and how did you decide what form it should take and, and all of that? And then how did you get it done? So yeah, well, you know, I had the ideas I would say were germinating for some time, you know, in the daily work of Pan America, we confront so many free speech controversies and we'd begun doing work on free speech on college campuses several years ago and you know whether it was professors being disciplined for something that they said in class or controversies over messages chalked on walkways on campuses demands for trigger warnings arguments that the campus should become a safe space all of that kind of really came to the foreground and what i saw was a real sort of generational and cultural divide in how people thought about these issues. A lot of older people really pretty horrified that young people seem so unfamiliar with and even alienated from the concept of free speech and ready to ask to be protected from uncomfortable ideas by their institutions, even if that meant letting the institution, the university administration have more power over them you know, young people ready to do that and older people saying, you know, have you lost your mind? This is freedom of speech and, you know, you ought to be more resilient. And if you hear ideas you don't like, you know, you just push push back and the answer to offensive speech is more speech. And I felt like the two sides were really sort of talking past each other. And so that was something that has guided our work on campus free speech, where we really make the argument time and again through trainings and workshops and engagements on individual campuses that the drive for a more equal, inclusive, and just society, which is what a lot of young people are striving for and working towards, is compatible with robust protections for free speech. And in fact, free speech can be an enabler of those social justice causes. So that basic idea, which kind of undergirds the book, was something that I came to feel very passionate about and feel like it needed to make its way out more widely into the world. And so I I really conceived the book uh, in the beginning part of 2019 and it was an editor. Honestly, I had sort of a, a morass of ideas and she, when I met with her said, well, why don't you make it into a set of principles? And so the moment she said that, I suddenly something clicked and I felt like, okay, I could imagine doing that. I could sort of see how that seems like a manageable task, whereas wrestling to the ground all these complex issues without a clear structure felt a bit overwhelming. And so that's how I started. Wow. And then what happened? How did you end up, how long did it take to write it and how did you structure it and fit it into the rest of your life? You know, it it was hard. I, you know, one really important thing was I hired two really smart research assistants. And it was a process to find them. And I had to test out a lot of people. And I knew sort of what I wanted the 20 chapters to be. And I had ideas for each one, but I needed them to pull examples of different kinds of phenomena and to look through the secondary literature. And so I sort of put them to work and they helped by creating memos. And then I took five weeks off last summer, because I, I, my job is really busy and demanding, and there's a lot of evening work and weekend work, and so I knew I needed a concentrated block of time. My, my kids were at camp, uh, which also really helped, so I you know, was pretty free and clear, and I just went to, I worked in the Performing Arts Library on the Upper West Side, and I would just force myself to be there when it opened, and I basically had to like rough out uh, a chapter each day and it was uh it was really pretty 
grueling. Uh, but by the end of that five weeks, I kind of had a skeleton of the whole thing. And then it was months of revisions and back and forth and engaging with different experts who I wanted to review different parts of the manuscript. But the kind of the psychological hurdle of climbing the mountain was really last summer. Wow. Well, tell me also a little more about your amazing background because you were you worked with in the White House for the UN, like you have done everything. Harvard, two Harvards, right? You went to undergrad and the law school. Um, like this is a an amazing career trajectory that you've had, and now it's ended. Not ended. Now we're at the stepping stone of your career, where there's a book, and you're leading this great company, um, helping you know enhance speech and thought and free feeling throughout the world, really. Um, so tell me a little about like when you were a kid, like, did you think this is what you wanted to do? Like, when did you know this is sort of the path you wanted to be on? And what, how did you start out? And how did you end up here? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was always sort of interested in kind of human rights issues, international affairs. Like as a young child, I was involved uh, in the movement to free Soviet Jews who were stuck uh, under that authoritarian government, couldn't practice their religion, weren't allowed to emigrate. And there was a big movement, movement here in the US to support them. Uh, and my family at one point traveled over to meet with some of those they were called refuseniks. And so I think that made a big impression on me. My parents were also from South Africa. They grew up in apartheid South Africa and I had a lot of relatives in South Africa who we would visit growing up. And my parents were not terribly political, but I think for me, it was jarring growing up in kind of the liberal suburbs of New York and then going to visit, you know, what was still apartheid South Africa in the 1980s and seeing, you know, segregated buses and beaches and water fountains and kind of trying to make sense of that. So. Actually, after college, it was the beginning of the kind of opening up in South Africa. And I spent two years working in Johannesburg as part of an, mostly, most of the time was as part of an effort to combat political violence in the townships uh, during the transition. It was kind of working with all the different political parties, the police, the churches, the businesses, uh, civics unions. And that was amazing and kind of really inspired, I would say, the rest of my career in human rights and international affairs, you know, being part of that momentous transition and you know, how it teetered on the precipice of erupting into you know, explosive violence, but you know, they sort of managed to push it through relatively peacefully and just being very close to the action uh, with that, which was just kind of the luck of being in the right place at the right, right time. I would say kind of kindled a fire that has sort of kept me going my whole career. Wow. That's a very unique way. I mean, I remember in fifth grade, we all had these uh, political prisoner, um, uh, what do you call it? Like bracelets. bracelets. You know yeah. I mean? They were like copper yes. and everybody had a name and my guy's name was like David something or other. And I wore it around my wrist for like a year um, because it was such a big thing at the, and not to say it's not a big, you know, it was just the cause, the issue of the time. It was like captivating everybody's consciousness then. So for people who might not have lived through that, um, it was, it was a great movement. I mean, they yeah. really did find those bracelets. I remember as well, they really did find ways to engage, you know, kids and, and, uh, you know, people of all, from all walks of life and make it active. I don't know if you ever did the marches that they would do down Fifth Avenue to Dog Homershaw Plaza at the UN, but they, those were really inspiring. It was the same feeling you have if you go out on the streets to protest today as part of the Women's March or the Black Lives Matter protests, like that energy and you're all together and you're chanting and it's, it's a huge release. So I think getting a little flavor of that for a kid, I think, you know, for, for some people, and I think I'm one of them sort of ends up being something very powerful that you kind of are, are, are drawn to, to try to come back to at different points in your life. And as you sort of navigated through your career decisions, um, was there any one point that you feel like looking back led you to where you were? Like, is there anything, any job you took or anything where you were having, I don't know, there were like two forks in the road and you went this way and that's how you ended up here um, and like how you ended up at a nonprofit at this stage? Yeah, I mean, I sort of had 
corporate uh, career where I, I was at McKinsey and then Bertelsmann Media and the Wall Street Journal. I learned a lot and I really enjoyed it. And I still have friends and colleagues from you know, each of those stages who I've remained close with. But then there was a certain point where kind of in my head, I was doing that to gain skills that I thought I ultimately wanted to use in another arena and so in something that was more human rights or public service oriented. So there was kind of a turning point where I left the Wall Street Journal and went to Human Rights Watch to become the COO, which was really using my management skills. Uh, but that was, you know, it was kind of a breaking point uh, to decide like, all right, if, I, if, if I'm saying this is why I've you know, taking the time to uh, be in the private sector and it's for another purpose, like I kind of need to make good on that because if I stay here too long, you know, that might really fall away and I might end up with a very different career than, you know, what I thought I was embarking on. And how did your having kids fit into any of this? You know, uh, I have two kids who are now teenagers. Uh, it's It's been, you know, amazing, but also challenging. I mean, when I had my son, I was actually fired when I was on maternity leave and it was a complete shock and, you know, really unsettling. I was very career oriented and then, you know, suddenly there I was kind of back at home. You know, I thought my maternity leave was gonna end after three months uh, and it, it went on for a while. I had to find a new job. And so I kind of, you know, experienced firsthand these very real conflicts and it was just because I, you know, my boss was sort of forthright. He's like, well, you weren't here. And so we reconfigured this and that, you know, and I said, well, would this have happened if I hadn't gone on maternity leave? He's like, oh no, definitely not. You know, you're doing a great job. So that was uh, quite eye opening. And then I would say the, the other piece that uh, was, you know, a little unusual was during the first term of the Obama administration, my kids were very young. My son was in kindergarten and my daughter had just started nursery school and I was offered a, a position. I wanted to join the administration. I was hoping to be placed at the UN in New York, but instead I was offered a position in Washington. And so I commuted for a year when the kids were very little and that was very tough. I was constantly coming and going. Uh, it was a lot for my husband to deal with. We were very lucky that we had a great nanny. We also had a neighbor downstairs who conveniently was willing to be a helper in the early mornings to get the kids off to school at like 7 a.m. So that was kind of miraculous. And then I, I, I did work like a day or two from New York at the end of the week, but it was a real high wire act uh, that I wouldn't necessarily recommend anyone do, but it was something that was very important to me. And then after that year, my husband got a fellowship in Washington. And so the family moved to Washington and we spent a wonderful year there. So, you know, and that's, it's, it's, it's tough because the years when you're career building sort of coincide very often with the years when your kids are young. And so there can be, you know, uh, uh, some real challenges and dilemmas. And I think a lot of women would not have ever contemplated commuting with kids so young. Uh, you know, I think we made it work, but it wasn't easy. Wow. Um, and you're, Ending up at Penn, did any of it have to do with your love of books? Do you love books? And if so, what do you love to read? I do. I mean, I'm a huge reader. I actually read mostly nonfiction. Uh, I like historical biography. I like to read about U.S. foreign policy. I love diplomatic memoirs. And my husband is a historian. And so, you know, we have a constant flow. He reviews a lot of books. We have a constant flow of new books into the house. And so it's in that sense, it was very natural for me. I knew a lot of writers. I felt like I had some connection to their concerns and the debates that take place within the literary and intellectual community. And, you know, what I haven't really done is work with writers. And in, in my job, especially with our, our board, I work very closely with writers and it's just been a great pleasure because they're just such interesting people. And I've been really fortunate with all of our board leadership that uh, they've just been wonderful to work with and uh, so insightful and just fun. And every kind of lunch and meeting and encounter is you know, a little bit sort of richer and more unpredictable than what you might have with somebody who is you know, a, a human rights 
expert uh, or a policy expert. So like what's on your, what are you going to read tonight? Do you read before bed? When do you well, read? Well, tonight, I mean, we're doing, we're, we're, we're talking the day before the election. So it, it may be a little hard to peel myself uh, <laughs> away from uh, the Twitter. I mean, I'm actually trying to get through uh, uh, Nick Lemon's article in the New Yorker about what's next for the Republican Party, because I'm very curious about that. So that's what's on my, on my nightstand right now. Nice. Yes. Um, this will come out later, but as we're recording, it's the day before the election. And I, I almost like can't even believe that we're finally here. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I felt like it would Absolutely. almost never come. It was like, oh, we're only like 83 days away or something. I'm like, what? <laughs> now here we are. Um, right. By the time this comes out, we will know a lot more about the future of this country. Perhaps, or perhaps not. I mean, who knows? Um, you know, these things sometimes drag on. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> We'll see. Um, so what's coming next for you? What are you looking forward to in this crazy time of life that we're all living through without planning being, you know, immediately accessible to us all? But what's Yeah, coming? look, I mean, for us organizationally, it will be a significant pivot no matter how the election comes out, having worked on free expression, you know, for many years and then over the last four years, a kind of intensification of our work here in the US because of these divisions over campus free speech, uh, attacks on press freedom, uh, this, this challenge to the truth. We've been doing a lot of work over the last few months on the rise in disinformation and how to inoculate people through disinformation defense training and really spreading the word about what to anticipate with this election so that people are less vulnerable to conspiracy theories. And so, that's been a huge focus and all of that work will sort of continue in, in different ways, but it's sort of figuring out what the new paradigm is going to be like. I mean, I feel very certain that the, you know, the kind of challenges that have led up to the last four years and that we've lived through over the last four years uh, do not evaporate no matter what happens tomorrow. But I think some of the ways in which we need to engage you know, must evolve. We've done a lot of work at PEN America across the country, really mobilizing over the last four years, recognizing it's just not enough to do this work in, in New York or Washington or Los Angeles. So we have chapters in Detroit, Dallas, Austin, Birmingham, Greensboro, North Carolina. And I think talking with those people about kind of how we men, this fractured society, how we can use the power of the written word, of great literature, the stature of writers to, com you know, commence a, a process of coming together, which I, you know, I'm kind of hoping a lot of people feel that's necessary. So that's going to be a big focus for us over the next few months, you know, and then there's just also the human level of kind of getting through the pandemic. I live in New York City, and you know, we, we lived through this in a very tough way uh, in the spring. I know you've uh, been very hard hit personally, and I think we're all, you know, we're tired of it, but we're also extremely leery and really thinking through how we sustain ourselves and, you know, the human connections in particular. I've sort of realized I'm an extrovert and I really miss seeing people. So this has been hard for me and I need to probably come up with a plan for how to get through the winter. Uh, you know, the summer was a lot better with just ways of getting, being together uh, out of doors. Yeah. I'm a little nervous about the winter coming and these first uh, cold days that we've had are, are really worrying me, you know, no kid play dates and how do you take a walk and I don't know, all these things that are the keys to my sanity. So um, I guess we'll just have to see, um, particularly here. But um, yeah, who knows? Lots of question marks. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I have to say, um, I was so lucky to have been invited to the Penn Gala last year, back when galas were a thing. And, you know, I was, I felt like a kid in a candy store because everywhere you turned, you were like bumping into amazing authors. And I didn't even recognize, I'm sure, three quarters of them, um, which is the crazy thing about authors is you can sit and read for days or weeks somebody's work and then like, you know, pass them crossing the street and not even realize. Um, but it was so amazing to just be in that environment and um, to have so many authors support an organization is really unique and amazing. So, um, 
I don't know. It, uh, and then you were so nice to let me co-host the Brit Bennett um, Pen America Virtual Authors Night. So I'm excited to do more of those. And anyway, Pen's just been uh, this sort of nice, bright light in, in all the darkness that we have these days. So yeah, it's nice to hear you say it. Just, you know, we obviously can't do the huge gala uh, with all the finery of the Natural History Museum this year. And, you know, it's sad because it's a, it's a great party and it's a lot of people's favorite party of the year. And so we really miss it. We're doing a virtual version that will be in the beginning of December. And we've got Patty Smith. We've got actually Bono is coming, not entirely public, but I'll let your audience in on the secret in the hope that that news will be out by the time this podcast <laughs> is released. And we just announced last week we're giving an award to Darnella Frazier, who is the 17 year old girl who picked up her cell phone camera and recorded the murder of George Floyd and then posted it on her Facebook. And, you know, the rest really is history. But she performed that catalytic act. And we have an award that every year goes to recognize somebody's courage in the exercise of free expression. And she just felt to us like a perfect recipient. We're also giving uh, that award. We have two recipients this year. The other is um, Ambassador Marie Ivanovich, who was the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, who faced this kind of withering Scorn from the White House when she spoke up about interference with U.S. policy on Ukraine. So two very powerful women, totally different, uh, but we're extremely excited to recognize them. And Darnella in particular has not really spoken publicly about this. So it's, it's, it's going to be, you know, nonetheless a special event. And I also invite your listeners to check out uh, the wonderful, you did that wonderful event with Britt Bennett and we have many other authors evenings that are kind of these intimate, small scale, really interactive give and takes. It's not like your typical webinar when, you know, as an audience member, you're just sort of in receive mode, or maybe you're lucky enough to put a question in the chat. Now you can actually with our events, have a bit of a dialogue with, uh, you know, a famous author, whoever it may be. We had Bob Woodward, uh, you know, we've got Susan Glasser and Peter Baker. We're gonna do one with Isabel Wilkerson. So I encourage people to check out our website and uh, join us for these events. They're, they're really kind of a balm for book lovers at this time when so many of the book parties and readings and things that we normally enjoy are off limits. Well, if you need a moderator for Isabel Wilkinson, Wilkerson, if that's available, let me know. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, I'm kidding. Anyway, well, congratulations on your book, Dare to Speak. Defending free speech for all. Um, this is really fantastic. And I am wearing proudly red to match your cover today. So thank you so much. <laughs> Appreciate the color coordination. It's great to see you. Great to see happy you. Happy election again. day. Uh, happy uh, winter arriving. Uh, I, I, I feel for you. I share the same feelings about the walks and the ways that we've stayed sane, but we'll find some new ones. It's going to work we'll out. We'll ones. be okay. Lots of, uh, lots of hot chocolate. <laughs> yes, <exactly>. precisely. <laughs> I think All we right. have the same, uh, we're attracted to the same creature conference, it sounds exactly. like. Exactly, yes. <laughs> okay, bye, Susan. Thanks a lot, bye. Bye-bye.